Leviticus chapter 19, beginning at verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you would equip us to do what we cannot do ourselves. You have called us to be holy, and now we desperately need you to actualize that in us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, last week we looked at the chapters on both sides of Leviticus 19, not going into a lot of detail, but chapters 18 and 20. Um, as, as I mentioned, chapters 17 through 22, they sort of form a unit of what we might refer to as the holiness code. And the same principles, the same foundations which we laid last week when we looked at 18 and 20 are the same principles, the same foundation which applies to chapter 19. God is holy, and therefore his people must be holy. In fact, all the laws throughout the entire Bible, they find themselves within a narrative context. God doesn't just give us a bunch of laws out of nowhere. They, they find, every law finds itself written within a story, and particularly a story of redemption. In fact, even if we go all the way back to Genesis uh, one where God in creation, God created a people and he initially blessed them, which is a command, but it's also a blessing to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Why? Because you're his image bearer. So it finds its context in the fact that God created us, humanity, his people in his image. Well, every law from their sense finds its uh, place in a context. And so here, the holiness code finds its place in a context. God had redeemed the people out of slavery in Egypt, and he brought them to himself. And with that, he gave them the commands. Uh, in fact, we get the, the um, Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, after redemption. But then, even after that, we found that Leviticus, in that, that whole... Um, God bringing the people to himself, he set up a dwelling place for himself with the tabernacle. And so then we had, what do we need uh, for us to be able to enter God's presence in order for us to dwell in God's presence? And so we have the whole sacrificial system. So the sacrificial system doesn't just show up out of nowhere. It finds itself in a context. God has provided a way that we as sinners can dwell in his presence. But then we had the defiling of the tabernacle in Leviticus chapter 10. And so God provides away another set of codes, uh, the, the purity codes, the cleanliness codes um, in uh, chapters 11 through 15 and culminating in chapter 16. So all those laws, they have to do with cleansing the tabernacle and cleansing the priesthood again in order for us to be able to dwell with God in his presence. And so now that God has provided atonement, he has atoned for his people. He has removed his people's sin as far as the east is from the west. That was the point of the scapegoat. He's allowed us to enter his presence through the blood of a substitute. That was the other goat. Well, now this is what you are to look like as you live as my holy people. And so all of these laws, this holiness code, finds its foundation in God's holiness. You are to be holy, verses 1 and 2, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. So if we're to understand this chapter of Leviticus 19, and my, my plan is, unless I change it along the way, is to actually go through this chapter two times for you. But before we do that, we need to set up some, some foundational issues. And so one of the things I want to do is first, I want us to look at, and I, I think I put it in your bulletin, we're going to look at a holy God. 
because that's the foundation. A holy God is the foundation for a holy people, which is the second thing we're going to look at. And then we're going to look at the holy law for this holy people. And then last, we're going to look at the holy means, which is Jesus Christ, how he has not only fulfilled this holiness code in himself, but also how it points to what us, what we should look like to um, imitate our exemplar, because Christ is the exemplar of the entire law. And so it's not just a bunch of laws or rules that we are to follow. You know, do these things because I'm God and I said so. A lot of people chalk them up to that. And that's true, because God says so, that should be sufficient for us. But God says so for a reason. And so we need to get under that reason and not just say, well, because God said so, I don't really need to dig deeper. God's holy, and therefore you and I are to be holy. So what does it mean to be holy? Well, first of all, God's holiness, if we think about it, well, the, the Bible doesn't exalt anything higher than God's holiness. Nothing. God is love, but the Bible doesn't say God is love, love, love. The Bible says God is holy, holy, holy. And it doesn't just say it in one place. It says it at least two times off the top of my head that I can think of Isaiah 6 and then in Revelation with the, with the um, angelic beings falling down, bowing before him. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so in order to understand um, what holiness is, um, I think, so some people, so if we back up just a little bit, if we think of holiness in its most basic definition, understanding, it simply means set apart. Now, some people think that is way too simplistic. Like you got to bring in, you know, God's perfect purity or God's perfect righteousness or his perfect goodness and all these other attributes. And I would actually say that's to get it backwards. It's because God is holy that he is all those attributes not the other way around. And so we need to try to think of what this holiness is. All those other attributes flow from what it means for God to be holy. So what does it mean to be holy? Well, again, set apart. If God is set apart, how is God set apart in a way that no other thing is set apart? Well, we might start with God being creator. You know, God is the only uncreated being everything else is created you were created you know you open up the very beginning of the bible it starts with creation why it's got to be created from an eternal being who is uncreated so that gets us closer but creator and created is not really what sets god apart it just points us there no god has being in himself God is the creator because he is self-existing. Everything else exists because it is dependent on the self-existing one. Uh, we would refer to that idea as God's aseity or God is a sea, meaning God is in himself. In fact, God's, the name that God gave Moses even points to this very aspect. I am who I am. God is Everything else is becoming or has became. I'd say everything else is still becoming because none of us have arrived to what we're going to be. Nothing is permanent in itself. So all of God's perfections fill up what it is, what his holiness is, what it is for God to have life in himself. There is no greater set apartness than that of who God is. And because God is holy, it means he is full of life. There is no life apart from God, which means to be God's people, we must reflect that of holiness, which means we must reflect that which is life. Hold on to that. We must reflect that which is life. You see, in our sin, you and I are dead. We are dead in our trespasses. In fact, every aspect of our sin is a nature of death. 
not life. It's the exact opposite of what God is. Our idolatry is to worship dead things. It's to worship things that have eyes but do not see, have ears but do not hear, have legs and feet but they do not walk. They have hands but they are powerless to do anything. They fail to reflect life. But you and I, we are called to reflect holiness. We are called to reflect the one who is life himself. So, God's holy people. What does it mean to be God's holy people? To be, well, first of all, it means to be set apart and to belong to him. God ransomed the people. He took Israel out of bondage and made them his own possession. He didn't take all the nations and make them his. He took a people and made them his. So let's talk bananas. Actually, I'm going to back up and start with apple butter. My wife made apple butter uh, yesterday. And why did she make apple butter? I asked her. And I asked her specifically because I was trying to get at the point of this question. Well, she made apple butter because we buy bulk apples. She buys cases of apples. And eventually those apples, you know, the couple cases of apples she buys, we don't eat them quick enough. So you know what happens to them? They start to spoil or go bad. And so she takes those apples and she starts to make apple butter with what's left. And she also made some apple danish and some apple muffins, which I had one for breakfast this morning. She didn't get the case of apples and immediately set aside some apples to make apple butter with. That's not usually what people do. In fact, if you go to an orchard, if you own an orchard, you'll see they don't take the best apples and say, hey, I want to make apple butter with. No. They don't set apart certain apples because they just want to set these apples apart. They set apart apples because of their nature. They're, these, these are the spoiled ones. These are not going to be the ones that are going to sell the best. They're not going to be the ones that are best eaten as fresh fruit. Same thing with banana bread. When you make banana bread, you don't usually go to the store, buy a fresh batch of bananas, and then set them aside so that they'd ripen for banana bread. You usually wait till a banana is a little bit more ripe than what you'd like to eat. And then you're like, okay, well, we'll set this one aside. Let it ripen and wait till it gets nice and black so we know it's perfectly ripe. It's got all that, that sugar, all that, 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 that um, um, sweetness in it. And then I'll make the banana bread. God's setting apart is the exact opposite of that. There was nothing in the apple already or the banana already that chose him to set it apart for this reason. He indistinguishably takes a bunch of bananas and he says, I'm going to select these couple out of that bunch. And I, these I'm going to ripen until they come to full fruition to bear the fruit or the product that I want in them. He doesn't say, well, because these are you know, Israel's a little bit different than the rest. You know, they're a little bit riper than the rest of the nations. I'll use them. Not at all. So our holiness, God has positionally taken us almost like out of a bunch of bananas. I know it's silly. Out of a bunch of bananas and has set us apart positionally for his good purposes. We are already set apart. If you are in Christ, you are set apart positionally. You are holy already because you belong to God. Um, we, it was alluded to already in class this morning about holiness. You know, we're talking about the Holy Land. Well, think about the burning bush. God told Moses, take off your sandals. Why? Because the land, you are standing on holy ground. Now, was that land holy the day before? No. What made that land holy? Because God's presence was there. The Israel, the nation Israel, that land in the Middle East is not holy in itself. A land is only holy where God dwells. God dwells in his people. Here in Leviticus, God is dwelling among his people. God's presence is what made the people positionally holy. Now here's the thing. Because you are holy, now be as you are. 
The theologians would call that the indicative and the imperative. The indicative always precedes the imperative. The indicative is what is so about a thing. Um, what, is, what is true about something. You're, it's true. God set you apart. Now be the set apart people God has made you. So the imperative, what you are told, what we are called to do, the commands, always follow what is already the case, what is already true about you. In Christ, God has set you apart. Now be the people you are. And that's important to get that right. Because we get it backwards and we try to be holy in order to become God's people, you'll never make it. You see, all this holiness code, and, and if I back up just a little bit, the, the law, the law held out a genuine possibility for holiness. A the problem is not that there was ever anything wrong with the law. The problem was not that the law was defective, but you and I, we are defective. If we could truly keep the law, then the law truly would lead to a righteousness. But you and I are not able to keep the law because there's something wrong with us. So the law, what it is, is a perfect reflection of God's holiness, not the means for us to get there. God had to do something in us to make us holy. And a lot of people will just, you know, it keeps them away from God because, well, I got to get my life together first. You're never going to get your life together first. You need God to do something in you. And then you need to reflect what he has already made you. Um, so the goal of the new covenant, because because we got we're on this side of the cross. So how does Leviticus 19 apply to us today? Well, the goal of the new covenant is the exact same as the old. They're not different goals, different agendas. God is still making a people for his own possession. And he's still making people after his own likeness. He is still restoring us to what we'd call an Eden type Sabbath, a rest in him where we dwell with God, not in our works, but in our rest where we trust him completely. And so both the Old and New Covenant sought to restore God's people to His holy image. But the law, as, as rigorous as it was, it failed to provide the means for the people to become holy in themselves. Yes, positionally holy, God set them apart, but it failed to provide the holiness which they were to portray in their lives. Because you and I, as individuals, we are broken all the way through. Um, a couple of hymn writers that I love, and we actually sang three of their songs this morning, three songs that they wrote, Matt Boswell and Matt Papa. Th they have a new song which they, they, they wrote. It's called Run and Run. And this is the way it begins. I think it captures really well this point. Run and run, the law demands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. Better news the gospel brings. It bids me fly. It gives me wings. The law, it doesn't give us what we need to fulfill the law. It is a portrait of holiness, but we need something more for us to actually live it out. So grasp that. As we walk through this law, there are demands on the law. God has demands on our life that you and I are to live out. But the law doesn't give us the means. So keep that in the back of your mind as we walk through these things. God gives us his spirit. And he gives us grace in order for us to actually live out this law. The new, new covenant, it supplies the means, giving us the promised new heart. And the law written on that heart that we see in both Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31. So that's the new, that's the holy people that you and I are called to be. So now let's start walking our way through these commandments or these, um, this law. Starting at verse 3. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father and shall keep his Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any gods of cast metal, 
I am the Lord your God. We'll pause there. Already, just in those two verses, we have four of the big ten. And every single one of the Ten Commandments is referenced, referred to, at least alluded in a very strong way in Leviticus 19, which shows you the foundation of the Decalogue here. Um, I'm going to return of, you know, you know I'll, I'll move on for right now. So, first of all, why in the world does he begin with the honoring your father and mother, or revere his mother and his father and keeping the Sabbath. Well, holiness begins where? It begins in the household. You know, you and I can try to portray some sort of holiness outside the house that we don't have inside the house, but if that's the case, realize whatever you do outside the home is only a facade, it is simply for show. Holiness has to be in a home, but also holiness has to be um, trained up inside the house. So, you know, as parents, we also have to train up our children. So the children are certainly to revere the father and mother, but we're also to train up the children. And we see other aspects of this is balanced pretty well. Um, later on in one of the verses, um, it talks about um, verse 29, do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute. And then it talks about the Sabbath again. We can also do the exact opposite by not treating our children as holy too. Also, the Sabbath. Well, the Sabbath is central to holiness. You see, we are to rest in God. The Sabbath gives regular rhythms, weekly rhythms, of which the people of God, as a corporate unity, would all observe together. The Sabbath is so central. That is why what we do Sunday by Sunday matters. You are not, will not grow in holiness apart from our regular rhythm of worshiping in the house of God, in the presence of God. You might fool yourself into thinking, well, you know, it's a personal, private thing. I'll just read my Bible on my own. I'll pray on my own. Don't want to have anything to do with the family of God. I'm going to tell you, again, holiness starts in the household. And this is the household. This is the household. And it starts in resting in God. And that Sabbath rest is, is a resting in God's presence. It's a, 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 we no longer have to work. God has done for us what you and I could not do. All right, moving on. Idolatry, um, which was verse four. Idolatry is the exact opposite of life. We already covered that. But it is a complete corruption of what holiness is. Is to go, is to go backwards instead of uh, being set apart as gods, is to go back into the world and worship created things. Moving on, verse five, verse five and following. When you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord, you shall offer it as offer it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it, or on the day after. And anything left over until the third day shall be burned up with fire. If it is eaten at all on the third day, it is tainted. It will not be accepted. And everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity, because he has profaned what is holy to the Lord. And that person shall be cut off from his people. All right, so now we have peace offerings. What do the peace offerings have to do with holiness? Or particularly, what is this aspect of the peace offerings? Like, you got to eat it on the first day, or at least by the second day. But after that, if you eat it, you profane God's uh, dwelling place. You profane his name. Well, the issue there is God has provided a means for us to have fellowship with him. And that should not ever be taken lightly. Do not treat it as common, everyday food. That, well, you know, sometimes we'll eat leftovers for a week. I'm never happy about that, by the way. My wife's not here, so I can say it. Maybe she won't listen to this. She stepped out. But God's, the, the fellowship offerings are not to be treated as common. They were a special offering for fellowship with the Lord. Don't treat it as common. All right. 
after that, we have what I have referred to as kindness, honesty, and justice, this next section. When you, starting at verse 9, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord. Looking at kindness, first of all, you and I, God has provided for us. We, do, we are not in this world so we can gather and glean every single thing we can, storing it up for ourselves right here. We're not to hoard. We're to leave some behind for others. God's given you more than enough. Remember what he said to David? If this was not enough, I'd give you even more also. I gave you yours. You don't need Uriah's wife. Don't take it all. Save some. For who? For the poor and the sojourner. For those who might not have what you have. Well, can't they plant their own vineyards? Can't they plant their own fields? Can't they go out there and harvest their own crops? Well, that is to fail to realize what God has provided you. You see, God hasn't just provided you with the goods. He provided you with the means to sow that field with the means to work that job, to make that income, to stay at home and watch your kids. Not everybody has those privileges and benefits. God has given to you. Don't feel like you need to hoard it all for yourself. In fact, that would all fall under coveting. Leave some for your neighbor. Verse 11, you shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, you shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. There is, there is an aspect of honesty that should flow from our holiness. If we trust God, we should know that God will provide anything we need. And so, therefore, we never need to swear by God's name falsely as a means to try to manipulate. In fact, um, when, when uh, Psalm 15 talks about who will ascend to my holy hill, well, it's him who is blameless, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. When you say something, when you give your word, you live out that word even if it's to your dis advantage. You don't go ahead and compromise and change because it hurts you. Holiness means being a person of your word, a man and woman of your word. All right, let's see. Next set. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. But you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. If you notice, after each one of these, he's saying, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Reminding, I am holy. You need to be holy. Again, this is a type of kindness. This is, means don't exploit your neighbor. Don't take advantage of people. You know, the, the person who needs you in order to make an income so they do work for you, don't take advantage of that. Um, the, the, the deaf, don't curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. Not only is that just not being kind, but it's, I think it refers to not taking advantage of those who, if they can't hear, don't whisper things behind their back. If they can't see what's going on, don't try to manipulate and before them. All right, verse 15. Oh, and to do such is not fearing the Lord. You caught that, right? To do such is to not fear the Lord. Verse 15, you shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. You shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Again, impartiality, um, this is a type of honesty, but impartiality. 
we will all stand before the true judge. And so we don't, we don't show extra favor. You know, we, we can get this confused, you know, leaving some of your harvest for the poor in the sojourn. We can distort this by saying, well, you're poor, so I'm going to show you an advantage and a favor and kind of skew justice in your favor. That's not being partial. That's not being just either. We are to do justice all the way around. So if the wealthy person is in the right, we need to act justly in those decisions. If the poor is in the right, we need to act justly to them. We don't skew it one way or the other. Well, you know, I kind of, you know, stood up for the poor even though he was in the wrong because I want that to make me look good. We can, we can um, distort justice very quickly. No, impartiality. It doesn't matter what a person has or what the person can do to you or for you to benefit you. You judge rightly. All right. Verse 17. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, I mentioned last time, this is kind of the pinnacle of the chapter here, or the pinnacle of this entire section on the holiness code, loving your neighbor. But what does it mean to love your neighbor? Well, one, um, hatred is the exact opposite of love. And in fact, uh, Jesus equates hatred to that of murder. You know, the only, the only thing that keeps you and I from becoming like Cain, rising up and murdering our brother, is God's gracious restraint, the restraint of consequences. But hatred always leads in that direction. And if it is not restrained, we become just like Cain. Don't think you are more righteous because you didn't follow through like Cain did. It's God's grace and mercy that has restrained you thus far. And here's another aspect of it. You shall reason frankly with your neighbor. In other words, if your neighbor has something against you or, you, or your neighbor has sinned against you, love rebukes. Love rebukes, but it rebukes for a purpose. It rebukes for the good of your neighbor. It doesn't just, you know what, I'm going to just fume and, and sulk in the corner while I'm mad at Robert because, you know, he didn't play the song I wanted him to play this week. Um, I probably don't need to rebuke you for playing a song different than what I wanted you to play. But silly examples help us, though, because if we really get personal about it, uh, bitterness is a real thing in our lives. And the way we hit off bitterness is to speak openly and frankly with our neighbor in love. All right, let's see. Also, it helps prevent sin. You know, thinking about, you know, Proverbs talks about open rebuke is better than hidden love. But we also have the idea of Ezekiel's watchman. You know, if you don't rebuke your neighbor then his blood is on your hands. So love warns. That is an aspect of loving your neighbor as yourself. Do you not want someone, if you're in danger, do you not want somebody to warn you of the peril that you're heading to? Love, not hate. All right, verse 19. You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor shall you wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. Well, what in the world does this have to do with holiness? A lot of people struggle with these things. And then we'll say, well, it's just to make Israel different and peculiar. Well, that's true. Israel is already peculiar because they belong to God. They are God's people. You're automatically peculiar as God's people. In fact, as soon as you're redeemed from Christ, you are in exile, Peter will say. You're in exile in this world because you don't fit in. You don't belong with the rest of the people. But this idea of not mixing things has to do with wholeness and purity. You know, holiness is tainted by mixing. And the people of God were not to mix with the people of the nations. 
And so we have all these laws that separate them and kept them not only distinct, but set them apart where they couldn't even eat in fellowship with the nations. Not until Jesus comes and fulfills the law and shows that it's not about food at all. It's about what it represented. It's about what it pointed to. You know, that which is common versus that which is holy. That which is unclean which is versus that which is pure. We're getting into some more troubling ones or more confusing ones. Verse 20, if a man lies sexually with a woman who is a slave assigned to another man and not yet ransomed or given her freedom, a distinction shall be made. They shall not be put to death because she was not free, but he, is, he, he shall bring his compensation to the Lord to the entrance of the tent of meeting, a ram for a guilt, guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering before the Lord for his sin that he has committed. And he shall be forgiven for the sin that he has committed. Why in the world this exception? Well, first of all, it says because she was not free. What in the world could this be pointing to? You know, I, some of these things I want to save to the end. And when I go through again, I'm going to go much briefer. And I, I ask that you please hold on until we go through these again. Because seeing Christ is so valuable for us. But there's a difference because if she was not free, then they'd both be put to death. But there's something about being un under the ownership of another that, that in one sense, and she's already set apart for a, she's betrothed to another man. There's something about this that makes it where, where God has um, provided an exemption. And the exemption provides mercy. And so that it's not as if it's adultery of the type where uh, somebody stole another's uh, husband or another's bride. Um, I'm, I'm going to come back to this and, and hopefully I can do something with it that, that might shine a little bit more light on it. Um, let's see. Let, let's, let's move on. I, I had it better in my mind and it just did not flow. So hopefully we'll get it right when we come back through. Verse 23. When you come into the land and plant any kind of tree for food, then you shall regard its fruit as forbidden. Three years it shall be forbidden to you. It must not be eaten. And in the fourth year, all its fruit shall be holy, an offering of praise to the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat of its fruit to increase its yield for you. I am the Lord your God. For three years, forbidden. Well, first of all, most trees in their first three years, you know, when any time people planted their crops, they were to bring their first fruits before the Lord. But trees, the first three years, they don't really produce anything significant. And so they are off limits those first three years, not for you to enjoy its fruit. And it's not valuable enough to present it to the Lord yet. So the first three years, forbidden. That fourth year you are going to bring the first worthwhile crop to the Lord. It's all going to be a praise offering. And then after that, you are to enjoy its fruit so that it will flourish to its abundance. It says, that fifth year, eat of its fruit to increase its yield for you. By eating its fruit, it will increase its yield for you. What in the world does that mean? But ultimately, it's again to treat it as holy. Those first three years, it has nothing to give to the Lord. You know, I tried to do this without my notes, so I left myself two pages, and I knew I was going to struggle. So we're seeing how this goes after the fact. <laughs> I'm regretting it. I need that crutch. Don't you need a crutch sometimes? Well, Jesus is my crutch, and so I'm going to lean on his spirit a little bit as I do this. Um, Try, trying to remember a little bit more of what I have here. Um, in fact, that, that forbidden fruit, it's referred to as, it's not, the word's not forbidden, it's actually uncircumcised. That fruit is uncircumcised to you. All right, this next section, I'm going to wrap up 26 through 31, kind of together, as divination, fortune-telling, cult prostitution, bodily disfigurement, mediums, and necromancers. So, 
Verse 26. You shall not eat any flesh with the blood in it. You shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. You shall not round off the hair on your temples or mar the edges of your beard. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. Do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute, lest the land fall into prostitution and the land become full of depravity. You shall keep my Sabbaths, Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Do not turn to mediums or necromancers. Do not seek them out. And so make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord. Well, every single one of these right here, they are some sort of way that the people of the nations would appeal to false deities or mark themselves for false deities deities. And, and so idolatry is instead of trusting the one true God, they're trusting in created things and they would mark themselves accordingly. But going through other channels to get a so-called word from God or from a God is completely contrary to what God has provided for us. Now, God has provided prophets for us who speak his word and to speak God's word, proclaim God's word directly. But then he's also provided for us the priesthood who seeks God's will a little bit more indirectly through their, their, their consecrated dice, pair of dice, the Urim and the Thummim. They would, they would roll them out and see what God's will is that way. But outside of that, God has given us the law, which gives us a general principle for which we are to live by. And so we aren't to go out seeking fortune telling. You know, and there are so many believers out there that people I know and I love that have no problem going into um, a psychic or a fortune teller or have their palm read or read their horoscope. Such is dishonorable, dishonoring to the God who saved you and set you apart from the nations. Why would you want to do that and look like the nations? Also, um, idolatry, it leads to physical bodily disfigurement. And of course, you know, the, the idea here is tattooing or branding yourself or, or even with your hair and doing different things. But you're an image bearer of God. This is not to say if you have a tattoo, you're all, that's not at all it. But these people, they are tattooing themselves for their idols as part of their idolatry. And as image bearers, we are not to, to um, disfigure God's holy image. You're a temple of the living God. Flee idolatry. And if you think that's just Old Testament talk, some of this even comes up in Revelation. There's a few other places where it comes up too, but um, just to track one down, the end of Revelation, it talks about outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who practices falsehood. That actually captures a lot of this whole chapter right here. Sorcerers were those who sought other means. Uh, I think the word is pharmaca, where we get pharmaceuticals from. We have a pharmacist who goes to our church here. Thankfully, he's not here today, so I don't have to pick on him too much. But um, that's not at all what he's talking about. It. But the idea was they would use magic potions and stuff. We are set apart. We don't need any of the world's devices to be holy to God, to live out the what God has designed for us. All right, stand up for the gray head is the, the next one. Um, you shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man. You shall fear the Lord. I am your God. This is, kind of goes along with honoring your father and mother. Uh, reverence in the community. You, yes, you only have one father and mother in your household, but you have elders or fathers and mothers of Israel. They had people they were to look up to who would lead them in the way of holiness. And then we have foreigners. And, and I think the, the trajectory, trajectory of all this matters. And, and, and hopefully I'll, I'll show you why. When a stranger sojourns in your land, with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you. And you shall love him as yourself. That sound familiar? You shall love the stranger, the alien, as yourself. Just as you are to love your neighbor. For you were strangers... 
I'm, let's see. Yeah, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. True holiness extends beyond relatives to that of strangers. Um, often, you know, yes, I addressed our, our facade that we put on. You know, in my own household, in my family, sometimes we let all that image we tried to display to our strangers, to neighbors, um, you know, we, we don't treat each other with the same kind of reverence and respect and honor and love inside our house as we try to put on before complete strangers. We try to put on a different face before strangers. Sadly. But that's only to their face. At least in our household, our family knows us. They know us inside and out. We don't put on a show before them. Now, we have a lot of improvement to do inside our household, but we need to carry that authenticity outward to our neighbors and to strangers. And that means those who are different from us. And notice that it doesn't differentiate between legal strangers or legal aliens and illegal aliens. The Bible doesn't make a distinction there. You and I, we are resident aliens in Christ here. So it doesn't matter how whoever got across whatever border lines you have, and I'm not saying none of that's an issue, but we are to treat them with love. We are to treat them with love regardless. Whether they came over here um, 20 years ago, like Sharif did from Egypt, or whether they came across the Rio Grande. We better treat them with the same kind of love. All right. Um, we are to love as Yahweh loves us. That was the point. Love is self, treating him as even the native. And then the last, or next to the last, we have just scales, which likely falls, um, let's see, it likely falls after the strangers because they're more susceptible to being cheated. You shall do no wrong in judgment in measures of length or weight or quantity. You shall have just bounces, just weights, a just ephah, and a just ten. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The strangers would be very susceptible to having different weights. You and I would, you know, we, we more likely to take advantage of them. They don't know our scales. They don't know our weights. So, so they're, they're very uh, susceptible to being mistreated in this capacity. And lastly, and you shall observe all my statutes and all my rules and do them. I am the Lord. Which just kind of sums up, covers it all. Um, just as Jesus said, keep my commandments. So what can we do with that? If, if we, I think we are still to live this out to some capacity. But how does Jesus satisfy all these? And some of these, they might be a little bit more speculative, and you can decide that. But I want to retrace some of these a little bit more broadly. Of, of course, as we go back, the Decalogue, when we're looking at the Decalogue, a lot of people like to divide it up. The first four commandments relate to God. The last six relate to um, your neighbor or people. That, that's helpful, but I don't think that's the case. I think every single commandment, all ten, relate to God. And because all ten relate to God, all ten relate to your neighbor and loving him well. Um, let, me, let me just try to express it briefly like this. Having other gods harms your neighbor. Idolatry harms your neighbor is not loving your neighbor well. Misusing God's name or treating God's name with irreverence harms your neighbor. But you shall not murder is against God because it's to murder the image of God. You should not commit adultery. That's the, we covered it last week. That's the number one way that idolatry and sin is portrayed in the Bible. We have committed adultery against the God who formed us. You shall not steal. We have sought to steal glory from God. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You wait, shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Um, living a lie before God. 
and you shall not covet. Coveting is idolatry. In fact, every single sin is a form of coveting. The root of all sin is idolatry. Some people say it's pride. Pride falls under the umbrella of idolatry. Pride is the chief form of idolatry. So as we go through these, Jesus, he lived out those Ten Commandments perfectly in reverence to God. Holiness begins at home, we talked about. Jesus reverenced his Father perfectly. He obeyed his Father. Everything he did flowed from love and respect to his Father. He rested. This is a Sabbath. He rested in his Father. That was his Sabbath rest. Worship. Uh, idolatry. Worshiping anything other than God is idolatry. But Jesus couldn't help, but he was God himself. He was God himself. Yet he did not exalt himself. Um, he did not find it. Hmm, I'm trying to think of the Philippians verse. He did not count it equality to consider himself equal with God, even though he was God himself. Instead, he became a servant for us in worship and praise to his Father. And he offered, uh, you know, those idols, those idols that were worshipped, they needed nails. Isaiah, Isaiah and Jeremiah both have passages that point to, they needed nails to hold them in place so they wouldn't topple over. But Jesus took that idolatry upon himself and became the crushed idol in, in one sense, he took the nails of our idolatry and was nailed to that cross to pay for our idolatry. Kindness. You know, Jesus didn't hoard anything. It was all his. He's the owner of all things and he's given it all away. He didn't exploit anyone. He sought to show compassion, honesty, um, and, and justice. He he did his father's will, even though it cost him everything. Love. Jesus is the essence of love. All that he did flowed from love. And out of that we see love means that we also speak frank, frankly with our neighbor and we rebuke our neighbor. And Jesus did. He came and he shared the truth. He spoke and rebuked People out of love, never out of condemnation. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. He loves you and me too much to just leave us in our sin. Purity and wholeness. You know, we, the, when we got to those verses, 19 and following, um, do not mix breed. Do not mix sow your field. Um, wear a garment of two types of material. Jesus came in wholeness and in purity. Even as a man, the two natures, truly God, truly man, they were never mixed. They were never confused. Jesus was whole and perfect in all his being, in both his deity and his humanity. Adultery. Let's see if we can sum this up and i don't think it's adultery is not really in the aspect here if, if we were to try to translate this a little bit more literally if a man lies with a woman in the lying of her seed and she is a slave assigned to another and not yet ransomed or given her freedom a distinction shall be made you and i were slaves to sin and bondage to sin. And we were, belonged to another. We had given ourselves over to another. And Jesus came and he ransomed us. Oh, he hasn't consummated that marriage, but he has purchased us with the bridal price of himself and he's taken us to himself. And yet, he does pay the full penalty and price of all of our adulteries in his place. Jesus takes us and pays the ransom to do so. Forbidden fruit. You know, there's an aspect of this that I think does go back to Genesis. Um, 
you know, not, not the three years or the, th but in one sense, that tree, it was off limits. One tree was off limits to us. It was fully set apart for God. And yet we ate of it. We defiled it. But Jesus, he did not seek to determine good and evil for himself, but entrusted or trusted the will of his father. He sought to live out his father's will. I did not come to speak on my own authority, but his. And so, so Jesus fills up with that. But then after giving it all, because Jesus is our tree of life, he gives himself as the first fruits on our behalf. And in doing so, the, what increases after that is it, the fruit of Jesus' life is overflowing with fruit um, to the nations even. All right, moving on to divination, fortune telling, cult prostitution, bodily disfigurement, all, all these aspects. Um, Jesus only ever appealed to his father. He didn't appeal to anyone else as far as, far as seeking their will. He sought his father's will. And he sought what his father made known. He followed what his father had made known to him. Um, but he did go to the dead after he was crucified to proclaim the good news. But also this aspect of disfiguring and mutilation. Jesus didn't defigure himself in the sense of, of worshiping false idols. No, but Jesus did become disfigured for you and me. He allowed himself to be disfigured for our idolatry. That is the end of Isaiah 52 and the beginning of chapter 53. He was marred beyond human recognition, marring the image of sinful man beyond recognition in order to redeem in us the image of God. And then the gray head, Jesus approaches the ancient of days. Um, foreigners. Jesus came as a foreigner to dwell among us. But he also showed equality to foreigners. He didn't set aside, yes, he said to the Syrophoenician woman, I was only sent to the lost house of Israel. But he heals her daughter anyway, even though she calls herself a dog. She's off limits. Ten lepers. He didn't make a distinction between the nine Israelites and the one foreigner. He healed the foreigner too. Jesus knew very well what it was to be a foreigner. Jesus came as a foreigner among his very own people. And in Christ, you and I, we are set apart as exiles immediately when we're in Christ. We are foreign and, foreign and strange to this land, to this people here. Just scales. I think perhaps why it ends here. Jesus fills up the fullness of what just scales means. You know, the, the um, I, I can't think of the Latin word, tally, lex, something. The eye for an eye, the tooth for a tooth, the life for a life. Jesus came and he paid out the full measure of justice with his own life. He used just scales. Well, we read from Isaiah 40 when we opened, um, or for our, 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 our assurance, you have received double for all your iniquities, for all your sins. That means a duplicate is the best translation, I think, of that. Received a duplicate. Jesus took that full eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for a life, upon himself. He enacted perfect justice so that he could extend perfect mercy to you and me. And in so doing, he shows us the perfect holiness of God. God doesn't compromise in any area, ever. And so, this is why you and I are called to be holy before God and to observe all of his commandments. Jesus didn't say, that the commands, they no longer matter. He says, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. You see what I did? Now I'm asking you to mirror my holiness. I bought you with a price. Be holy. For I am holy. Let us pray.